Good morning. Welcome to First Church United Methodist, South Charleston, West Virginia. This is our Sunday online worship for May the 3rd. Please join me in the call to worship. Though the way seems long and the road rough, yet will we trust the one who leads us. Though the direction is unknown and we don't know the outcome, yet we will place our lives in Christ's loving care. It is Christ who brings us out to green pastures and restores our souls. It is Christ who gives us hope and peace. Praise be to Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19, 19 through 25. I'm reading from the New International Version. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. 
When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins and his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, even though we have wandered and have become lost, the shepherd calls to us. We can place our trust in his loving care. For we are the sheep of his pasture, blessed and given hope. Amen. Part of the scripture this morning that comes from 1 Peter says, You were like sheep wandering away, but now you have returned to the shepherd. He is the one who watches over your souls. This is a direct reference to scripture that comes out of Isaiah that talks about sheep as well. In Isaiah 53, we hear, We are all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. These are the words that come out of the Bible in talking about sheep and shepherd. Separation. I'm wondering if any of the children and young adults that are watching with us today can remember ever being separated from their parents one time or another. Long time ago, when my youngest son was about two years old, he was brought into the store that I was one of the managers for so that his mother could do some shopping. And most of the time, Mason was tagging right along with his mom. But this particular day, I get a page across the loudspeaker of the store that says, Mr. Helmick, come to ladies' wear. Well, that was nothing new, so I went. And I was met there by my wife, who said, Mason's missing. And I said, well, he can't have gone too far. The store's not all that big. So we quietly put the word out to all the clerks to be on the lookout for a little two-year-old that looks like he knows what he's doing. Didn't find him anywhere. I finally had to get on the loudspeaker at the store and say, Mason, this is Dad. We're done playing hide-and-seek now, so you need to come out wherever you are. And about that time, I saw one of the round racks that was full of dresses shaking, and out from the middle of the rack popped a two-year-old with a smile across his face, as big as you could do, and he said, you couldn't find me. Well, I guess that overlooks the panic and everything else that goes along with that. And I'm sure there are times that when children are separated from their parents, the panic is on their end just as well, because they're not sure what's going on. But have we ever been separated from the love of God? This passage from Peter describes us all as sheep who have wandered away, and we've become lost from that shepherd. Now the shepherd watches over and protects the sheep, we know that separation brings anxiety. Even now when we're quarantined and socially distancing and locked away from our family and friends that we normally have daily contact with, there's some anxiety. There's a little sense of depression, maybe even a loss of hope. But we also know that when the day comes that we are reunited, it's going to be full of joy and hope and love because once again we see those who mean so much to us. Sometimes we may feel lost, but we know that God protects us and watches over us because God loves us and cares for us. As we look at the rest of the reading from Peter, the lectionary tries to make it a little easier for us because it drops off verse 18. 
but not really so much. It's still lurking there with the words that we do not have when it says, Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference. Not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. Well, what in the world are we supposed to do with a scripture that reads like that? It seems to be that it might be a bit of an acceptance of slavery. Now, I'm not so much talking about the slavery that we tried to end a few hundred years ago. I'm talking about slavery that's still going on all over the world. And in some cases, not referred to as slavery. It does continue in the verses that are assigned as an apparent acceptance of abuse. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, well, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, then you have God's approval. Well, quite frankly, I don't like the idea of beaten, beaten for doing good or bad. And I sometimes wonder where God is in the process. And I suppose it's reasons like that that we need to preach some of these hidden texts that most of the time don't get a whole lot of attention. There are probably people in our congregation and definitely in our community who are enduring abuse right now and somehow have come to the idea that God might approve of this abuse. They say that they need to stay and endure in such a situation because that somehow is God's will. I think we can do a lot better than that. I think if we dive a little deeper into the scripture and see what is being proclaimed in this passage, we might have a different understanding. Now on the surface there does seem to be this permission that this abuse, this holding one down, this one of being better than someone else or owning or enslaving someone is okay in certain areas. But is that really what the scripture is saying here? Abuse is not sanctioned and injustice is not approved. It's the endurance that is. Endurance is another way of talking about faithfulness. It's about holding on. The book of Revelation is full of the call to endurance, not because suffering is good, not because what is happening is good and that we should perpetuate it, but because it is a strength of character and a sign of faith. I suppose much of what we're going through right now, some of us would look at as abuse. We would look at it as an abuse of power by our government a chance to seize some type of martial law. Now these are all theories that are floating around. We now have rebellion going on in various states with marches and uh, civil disobedience. The fact that they want to go back to work. They want to leave their homes. They feel like they're being locked up for no reason. Endurance is getting tougher and tougher for people to handle. And endurance and faith just don't seem to mash up when we're talking about the current situation. Now, we might have wished that Peter had spent a little more time trying to erase the abuse that he references in this passage. The letter could have been turned into, well, just a little note against the institution of slavery or, in our day, trafficking. What the author of the letter chose to do instead was to provide hope in the midst of a difficult situation. And perhaps that's what a lot of us pastors are trying to do right now, is to provide hope and guidance and vision in the midst of a difficult situation. 
I firmly believe that this is an opportunity for many of our churches to take a long, hard look at the way we do things, the way that we can do things, and realize that for far too many years we've provided buildings where we expected people to simply flood the doors and come in, and that that one hour on Sunday morning would be our way of reaching into the community. And what we're finding out is that for the last 50 years, we have constantly been going downhill in the amount of people that come to church on Sunday morning or any other time during the week. With the steepest decline coming in the last 10 years, when we have dropped from 56% of the American public go to some form of church to 48%, a difference of eight points. Now we turn our attention to another way. And perhaps that's what video streaming and the others has awakened the idea to us. That we need to turn the church around and now focus on getting the message out of the building and into the community. And that we need to learn to engage with people who might see us on this screen in their home as opposed to coming through the doors on Sunday morning. It's a difficult learning process. It's a different way of thinking. And it's one that's going to puzzle us for quite a while as we find the right way to continue worshiping God, giving reference and credence and honor to what we've done in the past, but looking for ways to move forward and looking for ways to make new disciples. Some of the commentators, when talking about Peter, are referencing perhaps the household code of the day, when children were somewhat considered property and slaves as well. But I don't think that's the case here. If it had have been, there would have been categories for children and slaves and masters, those that were both, but there isn't. He talks only to the slaves. So why is that? Well, perhaps the only logical response is that the slaves were a part of the community, and many of the masters were not. Now, what am I saying here? It's sort of an abstract commentary, I suppose, on the social roles that were going on in the culture at that time, the time when Peter wrote the letter. It's also a very personal letter to members of a community who were suffering from the injustice of a fallen world. Maybe that's why it's easy to relate with right now, because many of us feel like we are suffering, maybe not so much from an injustice, but from a lack of attention, from a lack of detail in research and medicine and staying on top of situations. Peter is an attempt to give hope and a perspective and a sense of solidarity to those who might feel helpless and cut off. I suppose there are a lot of folks in our community that right now feel hopeless and cut off. This is a pastoral letter not one developed for social justice. Except that maybe there's an underlying hint of social justice. It's possible to read into the text what we want to see there. I suppose that's true. But there is a hope, a defined hope, if we listen. Now Peter goes on to compare our suffering with the suffering of Christ and invites all to that higher standard. Not that any of us will ever achieve that height. But again, it's a sign of solidarity with all of those who suffer. Again, the insight to celebrate is the inclusion of those whom society considered of no consequence, treated as property, in the faith, even slaves can represent Christ. Peter argued that it can reflect the fullness of humanity that Jesus was glorified 
in his suffering. And all of this included his family. The case could be made that this was an individual response to an unjust system. That it was a dismantling of the injustice in the task of the community as a whole. And not borne by the ones who were suffering under it. So comfort was offered. Even as change was coming. But maybe that's a little bit more than this text can bear. As a preacher, we have to ask the question each week when it comes to writing a sermon. Is it more than the church can bear? Is it more than we want to spend time talking about in a broken world? Is a case where it's difficult to represent hope and justice and glorification when so many around us suffer in ways that go unknown. But then again, that is the job of the church. To preach hope. To preach redemption and forgiveness. And in times like this, when we start to take a little more selfish view of the things going on around us, we remember the three simple rules that John Wesley instructed of all those people who came to be called Methodist. Do good. Do no harm. And continue to love God. Amen. Hi church, Pastor Paul here. And I'm coming to you from the chapel of our church. During the next few weeks, I hope to film a few segments here and there to show off a few of the rooms and things that we have. But today I want to bring to your attention our back door services. Now we had just gotten up and running with two services when the coronaviruses hit and we had to suspend everything. But we've not been playing possum and not getting ready for the others. Our band is ready to get back together and rehearse and do the things we need to. And very quickly, we're going to be sending you some new music and messages that are geared for our back door congregation. But this morning, I want to share with you a piece of music that came from Trey and Emily as part of our back door service and let you enjoy that. And remember that very soon we're going to be back downstairs with a remodeled stage and some new lighting and ways to get up and started on that. So I'm very excited about that. Also excited about the fact that we're going to get back to somewhat normal in the near future, but don't look for it to change overnight. We're going to be very safe about what we do and who we expose in the area of our services and our cleanup and everything else. So we've got your safety in mind, not only for your health, but safety for your soul as well. So be with us over the next few weeks as we go through these changes. Continue to pray for me because I'm working longer hours than I have in a long time. And uh, it, it's starting to show up in my sleep habits. But uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing as well, learning these new tricks of the trade. So right now, sit back and enjoy Trey and Emily as they bring us some special music. Oh 
sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes of his glory What a savior is any wonderful sing hallelujah Christ is risen bow down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen oh, Come to the altar The Father's arms are open Forgiveness was born in the Precious blood of Jesus Christ Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found We continue to be faithful stewards of God's ministry in this world and I want to say thank you to all of you that have taken up new ways of getting your offerings to the church for us to continue our ministries and all the activities that we continue to have here at the church and in preparation for those that we are hoping to reopen very soon. Let us pray. Consoling and guiding God, we bring our offerings and our very lives to your altar this morning. Many of us come feeling like we're in the midst of a storm with disagreement and discord buffering us from all directions. Help us to hear your voice in the midst of this, your call to serve, and your encouragement to endure for the work of the kingdom. Lead us to the light and hope of this Easter season so we can joyfully and faithfully serve you in the world. In the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer, we pray. Amen. I'd like to share with you some of our prayer requests that have come in this past week. Please continue to pray for Tony Brown, who is recovering from surgery. Also, Crystal Crouch has asked for prayers for Karen Bumgardner. Also, prayers for Aaron Coates, who's been diagnosed with leukemia and has started chemo treatments. Cindy Anderson is requesting prayers for Bud, who's having some health issues. Also, please keep Pat Burchett in your prayers as she is recovering from eye issues. Also, please keep the family of Francis Neff in your prayers. Francis passed away last weekend. Prayers have been requested by Kathy Judge for her friend Carolyn Brogan Purdue, who is recovering from surgery. And please pray as we continue to help our local mission, Heart and Hand, as we've been asked to rate our own pantries and our next donation date is tomorrow monday may 4th from 10 to noon and also from 5 to 7 here at first church lord help us approach the gate of this sheepfold with confidence let us walk through from our fears and doubts to lands of hope and peace 
trusting in the shepherd who seeks us, guides us, and cares for us. In so many of our ways, we are stubborn, yet you gently call our names, reminding us of your eternal love. As we have placed the names of those near and dear to us before you seeking your healing grace, help us remember that we also stand in need of your healing mercies. Help us place our trust in you. Help us reach out to others in confidence because of our love for you. Let us reach out because of your love for us. We ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Loving and protecting God, we thank you for watching over us. Sometimes, God, we think we have all the right answers, and sometimes we make bad choices. Remind us through your constant love how much you do love us, even when we get lost. And now, God, pour out your grace, peace, and mercy on the people of your church as we continue to fight a common enemy in our viruses and we continue to support one another with prayer and love. Be in peace. Amen. <laughs> 